Hey folks, Dr. Bob McCauley, and what I wanted to do in this video is uh, do a rebuttal to an interview that Steve Crowder um, did with Larray Keith, and he did it on his uh, show called Louder with Crowder, which is kind of a political show, but what they wanted to discuss on this show was veganism, and um, Larray Keith talks about why she was a vegan and she got away from it and then Steve Crowder talks about why he hates vegans and veganism and why he has a passionate disdain for it so I'm thinking is anybody going to talk about physiology here well they talked about a lot of things and that's what I'm going to rebut today Okay, so let me set this up. Steve Crowder is a comedian and uh, a conservative uh, talk show host. He's got his own show, show Louder with Crowder. And then Larray Keith is a, is a feminist and she's an environmentalist and um, she wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth. So um, she was a vegetarian for 20 years, a vegan and then she got really sick. I don't know why she waited 20 years to stop doing it, but she did. Then uh, Steve Crowder doesn't like veganism, doesn't like vegans, and he's never done it. And they both have thyroid problems. We'll get to that. But it really amazes me to hear this, this interview and see the whole thing. And, uh, you know, this is, they, these programs, they never have someone like me on, okay? You know, someone who looks actually healthy, and I've been a, a vegetarian for 36 years, and I've been a vegan for, I give it 15, 12, 15, more than that, 15 years now, 16 years. And, you know, they don't have me on. They point to other people. So I just want to have some fun with this, and I really want to just denounce the whole thing. I don't know these people. I don't have anything against them. I don't hate them. I'm not here to make fun of them. I think they're going to probably do a pretty good job of making fun of themselves. Who did not give up. Most people actually who try it give up in three months. That's what the studies show. And I did not give up for 20 years. And, right. and the process like, completely destroyed my health. Um, it was just an utter collapse. So when that happens, um, especially when you have clung to an ideology that strongly, it's really hard. Okay, so I, I chopped this up with this interview so we could just kind of compress it and get to the most important points. The first one being, it really it took you 20 years to figure out that this is not a diet that's working for you. 20 years? I mean, I don't think I would have gone any more than 20 days, uh, maybe two or three months to say, hey, I, I feel really bad or something. 20 years? It took that long? Okay. Um, because I hadn't done the diet wrong. So why did this go so wrong? Well, apparently you did do it wrong because if you did it right, uh, you wouldn't have gotten sick. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of what I'm going to make here today. If you do, if you if you eat the right way, you won't get I sick. A, I have a passionate disdain for veganism, but you have a passionate disdain for something that you know almost nothing about and you have never experienced yourself. Okay. I come at this from a very sympathetic perspective. I was in that world. I understand the values of that world. And I don't intend to give up the values of that world. And this is why the vegans hate me, is because <laughs> I still claim the same moral ground. Um, I won't give it up. And they're really mad that I could come to different conclusions. And this is where you bump into the fundamentalism you know, of, yeah. of any ideology that gets you, you cling so tightly that it becomes wrong. Yeah. Um, even if it starts out in a good direction. It ends, you can't hang on to anything that tightly. Okay, for some people, veganism and not eating animals might be um, a, an ideology. It's not with me. It's about, it's not an ideology, it's about physiology. It's about what belongs in the body and what makes you healthy and what doesn't. And what belongs in the body, as I've said many, many times, well, raw fruits and vegetables, we'll get to that later in this little interview. But, uh, and, and I also want to make a quick point here, I don't care what you eat. I don't, I, you know, and this to me, at this point, it's not about saving the planet or saving the animals or not killing. Let's talk physiology. Let's talk health. Let's talk about what belongs in the body and what doesn't, okay? And uh, these two have no clue. And one of them wrote a book, and the other one is going right along with it. 
And it's pretty interesting because he's a, a, a kind of a right-wing conservative and she's a left-wing radical. And, you know, they're coming together on common ground here. And it, tends to, it appears to be veganism. That's where, they, that's where the two meet. Interesting. Okay. Well, you know, I, I really hate that, and this is kind of where we can find some, some common ground. I hate this idea that if you eat animals, you hate animals. I mean, we have a dog. I have a, he's actually sitting right here. We'll bring up the hopper cam for people watching online who, you know, we adopted uh, a 90-pound, looks like the world's biggest, meanest pit bull who was balding. He had alopecia, broken leg, Lyme disease. Because we love it, we're, we're animal lovers, but I, I don't see. No, actually, you're not animal lovers. You love certain types of animals. Okay, cows and chickens and, and, and pigs, those are not the ones you love. It amazes me. It absolutely amazes me how some people have a pet and they love it and they cuddle with it and there's nothing to going out and taking an axe to any other kind of animal. I see a complete disconnect there. You know, look, look like in Korea, uh, especially amongst elderly people, it's very common to eat dogs. Okay, still even to this day, they kind of deny it, but it's not. Amongst the elderly people, this is, and, and it's just something they do. Well, we don't do that over there now, here do we? You know, in China, they eat cats, and it's pretty common. Uh, in China, they eat rat. Uh, I've seen down in Ecuador, they eat rat. It's very interesting to me to see, I'll eat this animal, but this one's all cuddly and I won't. I'm a little more just like, I'm not going to eat any kind of animals. Anyway, I put her outside. Wait, wait, protection um, from vegans? Confused. Yeah, well, yeah, I get a lot of death threats. <laughs> Death threats? De death threats, really? <laughs> From vegans? Because you used to be a vegan and you're not? I'm not saying people won't give you death threats over that, but I I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, what you, what, why, why is it that you got to threaten somebody's life over what they eat? Okay? Uh, yeah, it's not me. It's kind of like a Muslim yes. convert who needs to be executed. I'm an apostate. Yeah. So I thought that I was eating this peaceful, loving, sustainable, you know, totally compassionate diet. And it's not true. It is right. the most destructive human activity. Um, and those were the foods I was eating and, as somehow sure. thinking that this was peaceful and compassionate. It's not. Okay, so what she's talking about there is, you know, factory farming and, you know, these giant corporations such as Cargill and Monsanto that, that have all these GMO, genetically modified foods. Uh, you know, Franken foods, if you will, and how this is really destructive to the land and all this kind of stuff. Okay, but now I go back. Excuse me. I don't. I don't take any of my food from the factory farm. I don't eat any genetically modified foods. I, I don't eat uh, anything that almost nothing that comes off of a farm of any kind ever. Uh, if I do, you know, I always buy a local. You know, know your food source. I say it all the time. The part where we can disagree is about factory farming because I think everybody can see that, A, these, are, these poor creatures are just living horrible lives. Sure. And, and B, it is absolutely a, just a total waste of everybody's energy, um, you know, just cal from calories on up um, to feed bizarre things to animals that were not designed to eat them. And it right. is very energy intensive. Cows are not designed to eat corn. They should not be eating corn. It kills them. It makes us unhealthy. Now, see... There we are in agreement. And by the way, there's lots here I agree with between these two. But when it comes down to health and what belongs in the body and what doesn't, um, it's about physiology. And these, ta these two are really taking this and they're making it political. That's what they are. They're two political animals, one on the right, one on the left. That's what's so interesting here. And they're making this political when it's not. It's, it's physiological, what belongs in your body. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you're, you know, she made a perfect point. Yeah, you got corn being fed to beef, corn fed beef, they're, they're grass grazers. <laughs> I mean, a cow is a grass grazer. I mean, you could go on all day with this. I mean, I, I wouldn't touch that food, but, uh, and, and that's fine. But that's not what she was eating when she was a vegan for 20 years. You know, every single civilization that's ever sprung up around, ag around agriculture, it's the basis of civilization is agriculture, collapses. And it's because it wears out the topsoil. You can't clear all the life off the land plan it to nothing but what humans are going to eat and expect that to last. So civilizations last between 800 and 2,000 years and then they collapse mm -hmm. because that's the exact point when the soil gives out. I mean, you can predict it. It's been 800 and 2,000 years. The soil will not last longer than that. And, you know, they, they die um, essentially eating each other. You find human remains, remains in the cooking pots and that's the end of it. You know, it just returns to dust. Okay, I'm sorry. She's making this entire thing up. 
uh, you know, 800 to 1,000 years, that's how long you can sustain a civilization when they're, you know, agriculturally based. Where do you get that from? And you find human remains in the cooking pots because they turned to cannibalism and ate each other? Uh, come on. <laughs> This is just, you know, this is no reason to support veganism or not for veganism. And not to mention, you have absolutely no proof of this. You may have some conjecture. You possibly could even be right, but I don't think so. Um, because this is an activity that cannot be sustained, that's the problem right So there. basically, if we go vegan, fast forward a couple hundred years, we're Lord of the Flies smacking chubby little piggy for his glasses to create a fire. Yes, we that's, are. That's a very bad place to end up. So if you become a vegan, it's Lord of the Flies and cannibalism, and we're going to be eating each other. You vegans out there, it's, you're leading to the end of civilization. They just said it. You, you heard them. I, I got okay. convinced to do the green smoothie thing. Um, well, while. I also happen to have hypothyroidism, which is very rare for a young... Me too. Uh, yeah, it's, you're unusual for a man. Yeah, I exactly. got Hashimoto's. Usually, yeah. pr usually pre-diabetes. It's a sign of that. Um, and my doctor said, well, yeah, you know what? If you're doing all the raw spinach and the kale, which we've all been told is the best thing for you no. in as much no. as you can stuff in a blender, no. it's, it's not. T tell us just if only to save one uh, thyroid gland out there why the whole green smoothie, green juice thing might not be as good for you as you think. Yeah, a lot of those vegetables are really hard on your thyroid. Yeah. They just are. They're goitrogens, and they're going to do damage really hard on your thyroid to, to deal with all the compounds that are in those. Okay, so here's two people that are not very healthy. They both have thyroid problems. It's very common. Uh, it's a very important gland. Every drop of blood goes through your thyroid every 15 minutes. Okay? And, um, you know, it's really the precursor or kind of the warning to a lot of more serious diseases. And as he said, you know, type 2 diabetes, okay, sure, throw that one in there. No, I, I agree. But, you know, on that list of goycogen foods is uh, soy. Now, I wonder if Larray Keith might have lived on soy for 20 years because soy is a really, really a terrible food. And I've been saying that for 20 years. If you've ever watched this show or listened to my YouTube channel or anything like that, you know that uh, this is a bad idea. I'll bet you she did. And now she's got a thyroid problem. What a shock. Now, there's not any more than a dozen foods out there that are high in corkogens that are going to interfere in phytic acid that interfere with the thyroid. And you can't Google those and say, I'm going to keep those out of my diet. Really? Okay. Yes, you can. And by the way, spinach isn't on the list. I mean, spinach has got a really tiny amount. So quit, quit dissing spinach. Oh, and by the way, for the record, Green smoothies are not healthy. Green smoothies are super healthy. Just don't put gu guarcogens in them. Don't put cabbage, cauliflower, kale, bok choy, uh, radishes, turnips. You're not going to have a problem. But, you know, you, again, and these are, again, there's, there's 12, 15 foods out there you want to avoid if you have a thyroid problem. Um, and, by the way, if you've got a thyroid problem, you drink fluoridated water because that will interfere with your thyroid worse than anything else. Okay, it doesn't allow it to get fed iodine. So, I mean, just to take this one thing, these green smoothies and stuff all this stuff in and all this kale. So suddenly kale is really, really unhealthy. <laughs> okay, wait till you hear this next thing. Vegetables. A lot of vegetables are not particularly edible until you cook them, first of all. Right. I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. It was only a matter of time. You know, these raw food people are just really bizarre. You have to cook the food to release the nutrients. This is such nonsense. There's nothing at all to back this up. There's no science anywhere that says if you cook a food, now it's now now you can you know access the nutrients and assimilate them. They tell you about this about carrots all the time. You have to cook the carrots to get at the beta carotene. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. You don't need to cook a food to get at the nutrients. If you did, I would be so sick because all I do is eat raw fruits and vegetables. And what works for me can work for anybody. We're all 99.999% genetically identical. I believe a lot of those sort of vegan, raw vegan people, oh, if they cook it, it's bad. And it's like, it's not actually edible to apply heat because you have to destroy what are called anti-nutrients. Right. And anti-nutrients, that's one of the ways that plants fight back. Plants don't really want to be eaten either. They can't run, and they don't have teeth and claws like animals. So their only defense are chemicals, and they are the original 
um, chemical warfare people. They know how to make chemicals that can hurt you and that can protect themselves and protect their babies, essentially. Right. So seeds are really hard to eat. You have to do all kinds of things to trick them, to make them edible. Um, and most of the plant as well, it doesn't want to be eaten. That's why it tastes bitter. That's why it's poisonous. I mean, we... And we oh my God, this is such nonsense. This is just from planet X, Y, T, I don't know where she's coming from. You got to be kidding me. So plants don't want to be eaten. I think what she's getting at is plants are sentient. Plants think. Plants are sitting there saying, hey, I don't want to get uh, eaten by a human or an animal, so I'm going to make myself really bitter. And, uh, you know, and this is the first chemical warfare. Again, this is just nonsense. Whether or not a plant, yeah, a certain plant is, is healthy for you or po poisonous, has nothing to do with that plant. It has everything to do with the species that's consuming it. Okay, so for instance, uh, little, these little tiny mushrooms, they're called white angel of death. I mean, you think that thing sits there and grows as poison and going, no one will ever eat me. Oh, no, no. My babies, my seeds will be safe forever. Are you kidding me? They just are poisonous to human beings and a lot of other animals. Chocolate's really bad for uh, canines, for dogs. We can eat chocolate all day, it doesn't bother us. I mean, this is just nonsense. And you're giving sentience, sentience to plants? Plants don't think. The only people that, th the only species on earth that thinks and has self-reflection is the human being. That's it. Even an animal, the smartest of the primates, don't realize who they are. They have no power of self-reflection and they're not sentient, period. And you're trying to tell me a plant is? Are we beginning to understand that these people are just sort of making it up as they go? Again, Steve Crowder knows nothing about nothing about uh, you know nutrition or human health, and she's making up a bunch of crazy stuff and trying to tell us that plants think, and so the whole planet is the one big uh, Gaia, and we're all living together in this harmony, and they think, and we think, and we're not any better than a plant. Okay, we're the only ones that are sentient. She, she's, she, this is an insane comment. We, and we have no way to digest, digest cellulose anyway as humans. I mean, you need multiple chambers in your stomach, tons of bacteria that can do the work, like a cow can do that. We can't even do it. So most of the plant matter on this, on this planet is never going to be food for us. But even the things we can sort of semi-digest tend to be a lot more edible when heat is applied right. and those anti-nutrients are destroyed. I so know. This, yeah. I'll say it again. Cooking doesn't even destroy most anti-nutrients, such as phytic acid or glycogens. They don't get destroyed in the process, okay? And, uh, you know, so the idea that you're going to cook them and destroy the anti-nutrients is, is, once again, like soy. You know, the phytic acid is not destroyed. Uh, the glycogens are not destroyed in, in soy when you, when you cook it, okay? They still are there. So this idea that you need to cook it so now it's edible, absolute nonsense. I'm living proof. It is just one of those things that nobody believes when you tell them. Like, what? I heard, I heard the raw yeah. food diet, you know, because Andy Dick's doing it. I'm going, Aunt, does Andy Dick look healthy to you? You <laughs> schmohawk. Literally, I remember him, he was, he was on Conan going, I'm doing the raw food diet. I'm like, well, I'm going to avoid that. That's actually what spurred me to look into why I thought maybe the green smoothies were bad. And, and Rob educated me. And now, you know, it's funny. I do Andy Dick is a comedian who's been in and out of rehab for 13 times at, at, the, at, the, at this recording. Probably when you watch this in the future, it'll be a lot more times. He's a drug addict. And he started eating raw foods, and he says, I'm doing the raw food diet. He's a comedian. Who knows if he was even doing it. And this is your basis for not eating raw fruits and vegetables? Andy Dick, a drug addict? Okay, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it's, um, I'm going to stop eating raw foods because Andy Dick is a drug addict and he got on a raw food diet. Sure. There we go. A lot of raw egg yolks and I do the fermented cod liver oil. That's and, so um, good. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. All That's good. Very good things to eat raw. Some things are very edible raw. Some things are not. Raw organ meats, you should eat a little of those every week too. Sure. I know we are very grossed out in this culture by this, but around the world, across human history, those are the foods that are considered sacred. And it's for a reason. You know, some of the nutrients are destroyed when they're heated. Um, and so raw liver, you know, raw kidney, raw heart, a little bit every week goes a long way. Yeah. It's okay, so you're, you think people, people are going to switch to a raw food diet. <laughs> 
of fruits and vegetables, a vegan raw food diet. This is insane, but you're expecting people to start eating raw animals, uh, raw animal organs. And by the way, just for, just for the record, uh, you know, the higher you eat on the food chain, the more concentrated the toxins. So they're around 20 times more concentrated in an animal because that animal's had hundreds of lives than it is in a plant. And then you, they, they concentrate most in the organs, okay? They, that's where you find the most, and the most in the liver, which is the, the toxin filter for the body. So this is where all the toxins really accumulate, and this is what you're suggesting people should eat, and suddenly you're raw foodist. You're going to eat, uh, you know, raw egg yolks and, you know, and, and, and raw, you know, I, I got to tell you, it's just so funny to me that you'll eat something like that raw, but you wouldn't eat a raw plant because that's dangerous somehow. So the animal has taken the raw plant and changed it into something that now you can eat. And by the way, I just love the word sacred foods throughout the millennia, really. I mean, so this is a sacred food, and that's why it's sacred, because they knew something we didn't. Horse hockey. It's amazing to hear you say this, obviously, knowing your history. So <laughs> you're, you were vegan, right? And then you yeah. go into this. And you're not just, by the way, you're not just no longer vegan. For those uh, tuning in right now, we have Lear Keith with us, who was a former vegan, wrote The Vegetarian Myth, great book. You're, you're, you're doing like bone broth and organ meat. You know, they're just yeah. picturing you like 28 days later carving into a carcass. So a pretty, pretty big 180. Um, yeah. What do you say to someone who might argue, obviously vegan, like you said, is ideological extremism, and now you've kind of gone the other way. Do you think that maybe people who do what you do either just have a fascination with sort of self-experimentation or more extreme personalities? Because it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty drastic change. Yeah, you know, it took me five or six years to come around to all of it. Okay. So I went really slowly. Um, I think, you know, when you're young, you tend to be more idealistic and the world is more black and white. And I like to think that I've learned from my mistake, especially after the permanent damage that I did to my body. Mm -hmm. I move very slowly now when I make a change in my diet and I really investigate it. You know, I do a lot of research and not just on sites that agree with me, but all over. And I've right. tried to make myself scientific just to be literate in a scientific way. I don't have a background in science, but you have to be able to read studies and understand what's going on. And that's not an easy thing. We don't get good science education in this country. Um, and now with the internet, you know, you can just stick to your little bubble, find people who agree with you and never get challenged. And that it presents its own problems. So I try to be very careful as I, you know, have shifted my diet over the last few years. Um, but everything that I've done makes sense to me. It's, yeah. It makes sense from, uh, you know, just a historical, just look at the, you know, the scope of human history, 2.5 million years. And there's no question to archaeologists what we ate. There's no question. Right. The only people who come up with these just-so stories are people who are very ideologically driven. Um, everybody else agrees. And the evidence is just overwhelming. You know, you can see, the, you know, in, in the bones and the teeth of the skeletons, you can see that these people ate mostly meat. You see the tools that they left behind. You see the pictures they drew about it. Um, and then their campsites are filled with these remains. And there's just no question what we ate. Um, and you can also look at contemporary hunter-gatherers. There are still 46 tribes remaining of hunter-gatherers, and we know what they eat. Right. Um, so there's no question at all. And then you just look at you know, how our teeth, Change. our jaw, when people take up agriculture. Their health declines rapidly. It was actually a complete disaster for human health when people switch from these nutrient-dense diets based on animals to diets based strictly on carbohydrate. And the archaeological record could not be clearer. Their bones just crumble, their teeth fall out, and they shrink six inches almost oh, immediately. Geez. It sounded, it, like, it sounded like National Treasure 18. Nick Cage is going to show up because he has to pay his taxes. So the archaeological evidence is clear that any kind of agrarian culture, eventually your, your bones crumble, they turn to dust, and you become six inches shorter. I don't think so. <laughs> it's fair for me to say in the last hundred years, more than they did in the thousands of years preceding it? Yes, absolutely. And in the last generation, most of all. Um, yeah. And it's exactly because of those government uh, recommendations and the way that they put those policies forward and changed the way everybody ate. And it was a huge experiment on public health. And it didn't happen 
uh, without protest. There were many, many doctors who came forward and said, you cannot do this to the American people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no evidence that this is going to help. We have plenty of evidence that it might not. And the government did it anyway. And now everybody is sick and fat and stupid and dying. And all of these diseases have absolutely exploded. They've got diabetes now and children under 10. They can't call it adult onset anymore. Because yeah. so many children have it. It's horrible what's right. happening out there. I mean, it's and changed. And this is because of, it's just hor Well, they told everybody to stop eating fat um, and concentrate on eating grains. And right. that's what happened. They switched from fat and protein to eating a diet of carbohydrate. And we were not designed to eat a diet that's essentially sugar. Okay. Uh, our children are very, very sick. There is obesity. There is type 2 diabetes. All the adult diseases are, you know, are creeping into the children, no doubt. But why? Okay, because of processed foods. Everything comes out of a box. People are eating the meat that, and, and, the, and the fish and the eggs and all the kind of stuff they suggest. Um, and, you know, I don't eat it. And, um, you know, it, so it's not coming from an agrarian-based diet. Where is it coming from? It's coming pro from processed food. It's, it's not the basics of the diet. And let me make a real clear point here about the three things that we consume, okay, uh, in, that are contained in every single food, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, okay? That's it. There's nothing else. Now, fat is fat, okay? Protein, you find in plant protein and you find in animals, okay? It's not as high as people think it is in animals. You know, like in meat is maybe 15, 1, 5 to 20% at the very most, okay? Whereas algae, just for the record, is 60% protein. Um, but what's left? Carbohydrates. Yeah, that's called everything else. That's called the, all the plant world. And this idea that, you know, a carbohydrate is, you know, a, a potato, well, that's a starchy carbohydrate, or rice is a starchy carbohydrate, you know, in, in, or that it's just sugar. Well, the carb those are simple carbohydrates. Those are found in fruit. So once again, she, you know, she doesn't even know what she's talking about or she's completely misleading us because fats, proteins, carbohydrates, well, we go by the 80-10-10 rule, right? It's 10% fat, 10% protein, and then 80% carbohydrates. So what is she saying? If she was saying we've got to go to the ketogenic diet, this is a diet that's extremely high in protein or maybe extremely high in fat. Those are really the unhealthy diets. Most of what we need is simple carbohydrates, and those are found in the plant world. I mean, most of my diet, 80% of it is carbohydrates. So I don't know what her point is here, and suddenly, you know, it's just all sugar. Well, carbohydrates are not sugar. This is complete misinformation, 100%. Really careful. I um, eat a lot of cinnamon. Well, you, yes, that can help. That it's can supposed help. to be good for you because I read it once and I think I'm a doctor. Um, you know. Okay, that, what he just said, is, has a lot more truth in it than probably he meant it to say. You're right. You, you read it somewhere and you think it's true. That, there you go. That sums up this entire conversation and this entire interview. But nowadays, the chronic disease... It is definitely a problem that I think everyone kind of acknowledges, but just everyone tries to solve it a different way. And the misinformation out there, I want to get back to your book, The Vegetarian Myth, because you do realize that you are, are considered, like you said, an apostate, but n not only by vegans, but by general mainstream health right now. You know, you should be going to a Jamba Juice and getting a, getting a smoothie. You should be, you know, a majority of your plate should be salad and fruits. How does that make you feel when you know what you've done to your body, you know the research you've put into it, and for some reason a majority of the country is just flat out wrong? Well, you know, a lot more doctors are coming around. This is pretty much every day in the news you can find, okay, another study that shows, gosh, saturated fat actually doesn't hurt people. Right. We were wrong. It was even on the cover of Time, you know, where they're like, oops, butter isn't bad, you know. and it Well, if Time magazine said it, I guess... Is Time Magazine still out? Uh, um. Yeah, and you can say the same things about plants, that most plants don't want much to do with us. But there's a few that figured, you know, if, if we work together, it's going to go better for both of us. Right. And it's true. We've carried them all over the world. We've essentially conquered, you know, the forests um, to plant the annual grasses that, you know, were willing to be domesticated. So in the service of corn and soy and wheat, we've pretty well conquered the planet. So that was very successful for corn and soy and wheat. Uh, most grasses aren't willing to do that. They're not willing to change their genome enough uh, to make themselves interesting to us. But some plants have been. Um, you could look at the potato. It's the same thing. Uh, Michael Pollan talks about the apple. You know, like wild apples are basically inedible. 
but they were willing to shift their genome enough to make themselves sweet enough that we decided we really liked them and we've planted them all over the planet again. Sure. And it's the same with animals. There's a few, not a lot, but a few that were like, let's give it a try. And it's not, you know, us doing something horrible to them or them doing something horrible to us. These are interdependent relationships. And everything in nature is that kind of relationship. That's really my point. You know, if you watch this entire interview, she talks about how she, you know, is a big Second Amendment person, person has a gun, this big dog that protects her, you know, death threats, all this kind of stuff. I think this is not really from people who, like vegans, who are threatening her and offering her death threats. It's maybe from people like in the white coats that are going to come and take her and put her into a padded room. This is insane. I know there's people that think this way. It, they're wild apples are really bitter. Okay, first they're not. I I got a whole basket from my friend's property this year. It's a, a wild. It's an apple tree out in the middle of nowhere. We go out there, and they, they were great. Some were sweet. Some were more weren't. And in the the apple decided it would make itself a little sweeter. You know, first of all, the, the apple doesn't decide anything. And yeah, we we have done hybridization and and taken an apple and made it more and more, you know, bread it in certain ways and make it more sweeter so we'd like it. But the apple decided to do it and the grasses decided, you know, they, they, they really aren't interested in this. We're back to the sentience of plants. This is crazy talk. And I, I want to just point this out. It's not to, to beat up on Lorraine Keith or anything. It's to point out she doesn't have a clue what she's talking about. Her entire point of view is just, you know, kind of bizarre to begin with. And on top of it all, I mean, she's giving out health advice and telling you, well, you know, I, I used to eat this kind of a diet. We still don't know what that diet really is. You know, this is what always gets me about. I used to be a vegan and, and, and I got really sick. You know, David Vitalis has said this. Uh, there's been a lot of people on the Internet have said this kind of stuff. I always wonder what is this diet that they were on. I bet you it was a lot of fruit, probably a lot of, of soy, and most of it was cooked. And what were they really putting into their bodies that made them so sick? That's what the real point here is. Fascinating. This was an actual conversation with a vegan. She was talking about how she hated meat and it was, you know, it was cruel. And then she goes, plus, I just don't want whatever's on your plate because that's just dead. My food is living food. And to me, I was thinking, you don't see the irony that your food dehydrator is the Auschwitz of asparagus. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, this is dead. You're right. It's dead. And it was actually picked up from the local farmer's market, and I knew it lived a good life. Um, I mean, could one argue that if, if you're going to sort of create this moral equivalency between animals and humans, which I don't believe in. I don't believe that animals are on the same playing field as humans. I, I believe we're smarter. I believe we have a space program and uh, light bulbs. So let's start with that. Okay, so now he's, he's saying that plants are equal to human beings and that your dehydrator is something like Auschwitz, slow Auschwitz. You're, you're, first of all, you're drying a food. But I'll say it again. Uh, you know, I hate to get biblical here, but God put all the green things. Look at you know Genesis chapter one. He put all the plants for our food. I mean, but the idea that a human being is equivalent to a blade of grass. And there's a guy that I know, and he told me once. He goes, I've ch I've converted so many vegetarians back to eating meat. He's an Indian guy, so he knows all these vegetarians because in India there's, there's tons of them. And, and he says, all I have to say is the, the grass is living, so you're killing the grass. A, a grass, a, a, are you kidding me? I mean, it's one thing to say that about an animal. I mean, an animal you know, and a human it, are really, really similar because we're both beings. We move around. We've got brains. We've got hearts. We've got lungs. But are you going to compare an animal or a mammal to a plant? <laughs> okay, so there's no Auschwitz for your dehydrator or your oven. And the point is, is that, you know, that this vegetarian or maybe this raw foodist was trying to make was the foods are alive. Yeah, before you cook them, uh, raw fruits and vegetables are full of enzymes. And uh, when you cook them, you raise them up over a, a temperature of around about 110, maybe uh, some people say 118 at tops. Um, you totally destroy the enzymes. Well, the enzymes are the life force, okay? So anything that's cooked is really kind of a dead food. And, um, you know, and of course, you know, we don't eat, um, you know, raw meat, fish, eggs, or dairy. Apparently, these two do, um, but very, very rare anybody eat, ever eats any of those. you got sushi is about the only thing. 
Um, and, and so, you know, again, there's this huge disconnect between a plant and an animal. So meat right. eaters would sort of taunt me with that question about, well, what about the plants? And I never had a good answer because I didn't want to be the person that said, well, ad- you know, animals count, but plants are just dead matter. They're just insensate salads, and I'm allowed to just help myself because I didn't want to, I didn't want to put forward those kinds of hierarchies. I mean, this really goes back to ancient Greece, and you know, their belief was that there's no sentience at all in stone, and then there's dirt on top of that, and that's not really alive either. And then right. you've got plants, and they're sort of alive, but not really. And then you've got animals, and they're more like us, so they sort of count. But then finally at the top, you've got humans. That's not how nature works, in fact. It's a cycle. Well, thanks for telling us how nature works, Lorraine. I had no idea. An even harder name to spell or find if you're in a vegan diet, and you're not getting enough saturated fat for your brain. <laughs> this brain fog, what is it? Key, key. Pierre Leaf! That doesn't make... Leaf! No! She doesn't <laughs> like leaves. Uh, I can imagine. I will say, a lot of fat has definitely helped my brain. So, very interesting Does. stuff, Lear. And we- okay, let us end with that. A lot of fat has helped my brain. That's right. The two things your brain needs are fats and acids. I've said it a thousand times. But the idea that if you're not getting a lot of plant material into your diet, that you are getting what we call essential fatty acids and you're getting, you know, which are great for your heart, of course. They perform functions all over the body. They're really needed for the brain, uh, that you're not getting them. If you just go on this animal diet uh, or on a, on a really high ketogenic diet where, you know, you're eating all this protein, you're going to get a lot of fat. Animal fat is practically worthless to the human body. All the really healthy fat comes from the plant world, and it's particularly healthy when you don't cook the plant first. Anyway, interesting uh, interview. I just wanted to kind of weigh in, as my dad used to say, put my two cents in there. Now, there it is. You can make up your own mind. Dr. Bob McCauley, I'll see you guys next time.